India at the crossroads. We have Louis Tillin, Sunil Kildani, John Elliott, and the session will be moderated by Meghna Desai. He's a famous writer. He's written 25, more than 25 books, actually. And the session is presented by the Hindu Center. The session will be introduced by the editor-in-chief editor of the Hindu, Mr. N. Ravi. So I welcome to the authors and to Mr. Ravi on the stage. That's fine. <laughs> oh, that I see John. Come on, John. Run. Run. Good evening. Hi. I have great pleasure in presenting this distinguished panel oh on behalf of the Hindu Center for Politics and Public Policy. The center is a public policy initiative of the Hindu group of publications aimed at contributing to the current public discourse. We have an amazing panel in which the insider and outsider perspectives on issues become fluid and merge with the insider becoming the outsider, the outsider, the insider. The incomparable Lord Meghnath Desai and Sunil Kilnani, who keeps the India studies thriving at King's College, because of their positions and where they live, are able to step aside and view things somewhat more clearly than most of us living here. On the other hand, whom, what we would normally regard as outsiders, Louis Stellin and John Elliott are deeply engaged observers and scholars of India. Without further ado, I now hand it over to Lord Meghnath Desai. Thank you, thank you very much uh, for that. You speak without uh, notes, to you. I Success to the Hindu Center for Public Policy. Uh, now, I have got a very rich menu on hand. I've got uh, two authors uh, who have who have done their own different perspective on India. And I have the granddaddy of all books on India here on my left. Uh, uh, and I think we should have a very good discussion. So I'm going to start with uh, John. OK? I'll give you, you ready? I'm ready. OK. Uh, having caught the breath. I'll give you first a little bit time to implode your book on the unsuspecting audience. Tell us what, it is, what is in it. The question I've been promised, which um, wasn't the one that came, <laughs> ah. was um, are you suggesting that India is going to implode or to explode? <laughs> which, uh, if you want to ask me that question, then I'll, I'll answer that. Okay. Is India um, going to implode the, the, or explode? The book which I've just <laughs> completed, um, in fact, we completed it last weekend, and digital copies are in the bookshop, amazingly, thanks to HarperCollins' incredible um, production, um, is called Implosion, India's Tryst with Reality. Uh, Implosion was its working title for about a year and a half, and the gradually the nearer we got to finishing it, the more it seemed to be apt. I'm not suggesting an explosion where the country blows up. I'm not, ex I'm not suggesting a, a situation where suddenly everything implodes and we wake up one morning um, and, and, and there's no functioning India. Uh, once I got the title, I then had to find a suitable definition and I hunted through Google, which solves all problems for journalists and writers and many other people too, um, and came, a, came across, um, there's, many, there's many connotations, and most people envisage something which is sudden, and sudden implosion. What I'm talking about 
is, is gradual erosion of the effectiveness of the institutions, the organizations, <laughs> and the systems that support, support democracy. And I go on later in the book to talk about how democracy in India has become a smokescreen for everything which isn't achieved. As, as democracy allows most of the worst, the worst things to happen, in, and India's in denial on this. It has not accepted the fact that democracy is so brilliant and should not be changed as a concept, in fact, is not working. It does elect people, it does give people in the, in, the, in, the, in the electorate the feeling that they have the freedom to throw governments out, which they do do, of course, but then, the, and, and that they've elected people. But those elected people often bully them and, and govern badly, and, and all the stories, well, I, one doesn't need to explain this in detail, all the stories that have flooded across the, the newspapers and media for, for many years now um, as, as support that. So what I'm talking about is a gradual, insidious, um, slow collapse of institutions, and that's, I think, what needs to be tackled. Um, I say this as a journalist. I've been here, living here. I first came here 30 years ago for the Financial Times. I went away and came back again in the mid-90s, and I've been here since writing for Fortune and for The, um, for the Economist, mostly. Uh, so I've seen, uh, I've watched it happening. I didn't set out to write a book which was going to be called Implosion. I set out to write a book on India and gradually came round to this view. Very good. Okay, we will come back to that. But I, I, I just wanted to put it to Louis, uh, tell him written book, a very interesting book called Remapping India. But when I was young, and I was once, setting up linguistic states was thought by Nehru to be the beginning of the end of India <laughs> as such. Now you have mapped, it's very interesting, and of course it's not over yet. What is your perspective? Yes, well, it's interesting, really, how far we've come from those days in the 1950s when the creation of linguistic states was seen to be a, a potential threat to the very well, idea of India. Mm -hmm. um, and now India is able to debate and to create new states um, almost without rendering that kind of existential crisis about what India is. Mm. Um, that political regionalism, um, the malleability of identity has almost become so normal um, that it has ceased to be a major threat to mm. the viability of, of Indian nationhood. The, the ability of Indians to hold multiple identities mm. and for them not to be in conflict, I think, um, <coughs> is, is, a, is a striking feature of the last several decades of, of India's democratic history. And, and that's the context, really, for the book that, that I'm releasing this week in India, Remapping India, um, which, which tells that story of the institutionalization of regional political identities um, at a moment when, and, and to kind of play on the title of this panel, at a, the, uh, a kind of following trends from an earlier crossroads, that of the decline of a Congress party dominated polity where the dominance of the Congress party was itself something which was seen to, to, to kind of be the glue of nationhood. Um, where we've seen the evolution of Indian federalism and, and Indian democracy as a, as a, within a federal context um, a, as an alternative. Yeah. Um. Can, I, can I, since you are the Copy ho patent holder of the right of idea of India. I wish I would have uh, made a little bit more let money. Me, let, me, let me put it this way: that, that sort of two ways of putting this. First of all, you know, Gandhiji said, "It's not that the British divide and rule; we divide and they rule." Uh, is it the case that the division and subdivision gives more stability to the union, unlike what we thought, and and the idea of breaking up uh, Andhra or breaking up uh, UP? into many states is really a way of not letting any state get too large. Or do you think that there really is an erosion of the idea of India, which once we celebrated as a, as a great thing? I mean, I think there is a way in which the, actually, the, the, the expansion of Indian federalism, if you like, the, the creation of new states, the creation of new units and subunits actually does support and strengthen and sustain uh, what one can refer to as the idea of India, in, in the sense that if you even if, if you look at the sort of phases uh, uh, over the last 60 years when new sub-national units have been created in India, there have been roughly 
well, there have been two moments of the creation and then one when there were very strong challenges. The first was, as uh, Louise referred to in the 1950s, yeah. uh, with the creation of the linguistic states. And there was great anxiety about that at the time, that this would lead to, as it was called at the time, fissiparous tendencies. This was, of course, in the, uh, with the shadow of partition still looming over uh, the 1950s. In fact, what it did was to strengthen the federal system. In the 1980s, you had a different kind of moment of challenge uh, to, to, the, to the federal order with violent secessionist movements in, in Punjab, in Assam, in the Northeast, and then later in Kashmir, but in the late, late 90s. And that was a different kind of challenge, I think partly a reaction to the over-centralization that had occurred during the late 60s and 1970s in Delhi, and which had taken powers away from the federal order. So you had this kind of reaction back. Um, the third moment, and, and sorry, and, and in that second moment, so you didn't actually get the creation of new states, but you got the slow restoration of internal democratic workings within those states. Uh, so Punjab, you know, for a combination of that plus, plus some very severe uh, repression as well. Uh, in, you know, Punjab is a clear, a clear instance of that, where it's a combination of severe uh, uh, repression of the, 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 the Khalistan movement there, plus the bringing back into the political process by the late 1980s, and the same in the Northeast, uh, Manipur and so on. The third great moment was in 2000, when, when the, the new states were created, uh, which are very much the subject of Louise's book. And the, the, the pressures there were not about identity on the whole. There were a diverse range of political interests, partly developmental arguments that smaller units would, would, would help uh, in, in, in better development for those states. And that, again, the creation of those states actually has strengthened the union. And one way in which it does that is it creates, it's a modular system. So each state then, in a sense, mimics the national uh, a picture. You have the emergence of a, a, a state level party system. You have the creation of a, a, a secretariat, a le legislative assembly. So there's a kind of buy-in into the national system. There's a, a kind of modular effect. All the units look like one another and therefore have a kind of hold together better. And the second way in which there's a buy-in effect is also because today we of course have a coalitional model at the center. So the, the regional states, the regional parties of the regional states have a great interest in having stake in, nas uh, stake in national power and, and, um, and you know, being able to get benefits for their own state by being uh, kingmakers in the national government. So I think the, the, the process has been one that has helped to, to, to integrate yeah. and actually sustain the union. Now, let, let, me, let me put it this way. When you create you know, two assemblies where there was one before, there is a double rent seeking. You know, there are more people who get into jobs and contracts and so on. And so it may look from outside like this is a decay and erosion rather than a liberalizing. Is that your impression or your, your worries are from some totally different direction? Well, I'd look at it differently. I mean, I have, I'm, I'm in the happy position of being the only non-academic on, um, on the platform. There's, I'm surrounded by three learned people who philosophize, and I have a much sort of more basic journalist view. <laughs> um, and I don't think you can put much highfalutin um, philosophy on, on the creation of states at the moment. Uh, they set the proposed separation of... Um, on splitting of Andhra Pradesh into Telangana is nothing more than crude politics at the moment, aimed at, and it will probably fail, getting Congress more seats in Andhra Pradesh than it would otherwise done if it hadn't split it. The curious thing is that Sonia Gandhi, in deciding that a, a claim which undoubtedly has had good reason to be around since the 1950s or 1940s, 1950s, I think. Um, uh, and, and has been kicked into touch by successive governments is now being picked up and done because Sonia Gandhi has decided she wants more seats. The irony is that the people who are opposing the split are the businessmen in, the, in Hyderabad, which is the Telangana region, who've come in from the coast, moved into the centre, made a fortune illicitly, illegally, <coughs> corruptly with the previous chief minister, and they're opposing the split. Now, that chief minister used to carry suitcases metaphorically to number 10 Jan Path. So it's very <laughs> curious that she is now, that Sonia Gandhi is now um, in, 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 doing a split, which a lot of the people who've been the money bags for the Congress party are objecting to. So 
let's not put too high, high, high philosophy on these things. It's true politics at the end of the day. You, you, you talked about telling an <laughs> in your you talked about telling an in your book as a next sort of thing, and from your thing on Chhattisgarh and uh, Jharkhand, you agree with this as really basically a loot. Well, I'll just point to the subtitle <laughs> of my book, yeah. Remapping India, New States and Their Political Origins. Right. Um, so, um, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I, I am totally open-eyed <laughs> about the politics that lie behind no, the I was just having a bit of fun states. with academics. But, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, but you make a good point about the dynamics of this, this particular moment in, in Telangana. And it, I mean, much of the research that I did for the book involved reconstructing fairly small-minded, very local, regional political histories, and in which it didn't seem there was much that yes. felt terribly edifying. <clears throat> but the, 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 the kind of culmination of those multiple political moves in very localized spaces that you know, only real political geeks like me might, might kind of spend years follow, following yeah, yeah. Um, is an ability to question and change the boundaries of political and economic life um, in ways that don't, don't, that don't, that don't right. bring the country to its to its. And Maya Wati, of course, um, suddenly dreamt up three states for, for, for Uttar Pradesh. Four states. Yeah. Four yeah. states. Yeah. Yeah. When, she, when she thought it would make her political capital. Sure. Yes, in some ways, but that's also a reflection of the way that new chief ministers have started to reimagine yeah. their states uh, not only politically, but mm. in their, I mean, I, I write also about this in the book, in terms of their, their sacred geography. Maiwati's project for UP is, is quite different to, you know, to an earlier uh, kind of yes. generation yeah. of Congress yeah. politicians. Yeah. You, know, you, could, you, could, you could take the view, and I want to uh, see what uh, Sunil thinks. Like, you know, okay, you create more state capitals, more buildings, more infrastructure projects, more money, but, you know, it's a small, small price to pay. For uh, for entertaining new identities, respecting them, and it's a big country. You know why only have you know 25 states? Why not have 50 states? You know Nigeria has done that. It went from very few states to 36 states, and it maybe the federalism is a very creative force, expensive though it may be. You think that? Well, I, I do think that, and I just I want to come back to the point in fact where John also began, which is you know about this gradual erosion of institutions, which it, it look, may look like it, it, in one perspective, um, but I think also one needs to remember that you know there's also there's been an amazing capacity for institutional invention in India, and I think. Um, Certainly in the early years, uh, in, in the late 1940s, the constitution itself, and then into the 1950s, you saw amazing experimentation with different kinds of institutions. The most important of those was the, to develop a kind of architecture uh, through the constitution to represent the huge diversity of the country. Now, you know, everyone asserts the diversity of the country, but actually how do you turn that into forms that can be represented and that can be made workable in politics. And I, I think the way in which the Constitution and the years after did it were really quite remarkable. So you took an issue like uh, identity across different forms, religion, language, cultural identity, and created, you know, on the one hand, a federal structure, the democratic electoral system, the system of uh, a kind of legal pluralism in, 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 in the civil laws of the country. Not, I'm not saying all of these can't have problematic aspects to them. They do. They're improvisatory. They, they necessarily run into difficulties. But it was a very interesting kind of moment of institutional invention. I think what we have perhaps not done sufficiently since then is to maintain that capacity for, for invention and reinvention of institutions. <coughs> We're still living off the capital. Uh, the institutional capital that was created in many ways earlier on. But even, even having said that, you, there's still some very interesting new inve innovations happening at the institutional level, at the, at the level of, uh, of institutions, sometimes at the more local level. Um, and you know, decentralization is, is, is another aspect that, that, that might be worth talking about. But it seems to me that, the, the, and, and you know, again, John and Louise's point about the way in which states were created were often for very 
uh, uh, you know, low reasons for personal interest and so on. The art of institution building is to be able, or, is to be, or the art of successful institutions is to be able to turn private vices into public virtue. Uh, and, and in a sense, that's the challenge that institutional builders have to do because all institutions have to assume that those who inhabit them are going to be knaves. They're in there for their own private interests. So how do you turn that round into a way that serves the public purpose? That's the skill of building an institution. That's a remarkable skill I think we showed in the late 40s, 1950s, and that's the kind of skill we need to kind of encourage and, and, and develop today. Okay, so let me, let me push this out a little bit more. <clears throat> I once uh, went to debate on political stability Political stability meant Congress was no longer in power, so they were all worried about stability. And Kashiram was there, he said, I'm not interested in stability. I want fragile coalition governments so that my people can have something out of the system. So when there's stable governments, you guys rule over us guys. Mm -hmm. And I want instability, I want fragility. No, is that the case that in that struggle for uplifting of the lower uh, caste and lower classes, Things have been done which have eroded institutions regardless of setting up the state, i.e. at the center, things have decayed. Mm. Is that your perspective? They have decayed. The yeah, is that your perspective? Yes, it is, yes. Yeah. <clears throat> and is that because of uh, a single political party congress or the political no, no, process? No, it's, it's no, happened over, it's happened over a long period. Um, it, it's happened mainly through corruption, <coughs> um, through, <coughs> through patronage, partly through dynasty not just the one dynasty, but all of the dynasties. It's been the growth of dynasties, which are more interested in perpetuating family power and family wealth than they are in producing good governance. Um, it's, it's the legal system. When I first came to India in 1982-83, it was unthinkable um, that the judiciary was, was, was corrupt. Yeah. Um, when I came back in the 90s, I heard it, and I said to some people as I met them, is it true that the judiciary has, been, has got very corrupt in the six years I've been away? Oh, no, they said, no, 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 no. It's just one judge in Calcutta. Don't worry about it. It's just one judge in Calcutta. <laughs> Um, that gradually changed, and, and you couldn't say one judge in any city now. Um, and that is a, an appalling erosion, um, implosion, to use my title, of the judicial system. Mm. In just, well, I came here 30 years ago. It was fine when I left at the end of the 80s, so it's 20 years. Yeah. 20, 20 years or so, a, a, a massive um, er erosion. Initially, uh, from what I heard, um, though I was never part of it, unfortunately, to discover properly how it worked, was files being moved up and down. Yeah. You persuaded the peon in the office to, to slow the case down or to speed it up, deciding with, depending which side you were. Uh, but then it was buying the judge and buying the witnesses and buying witnesses to change their, um, to the, change their testimony so that a BMW that runs over five people in a road in the middle of the night in Delhi suddenly becomes a tractor or a truck <laughs> about six months later. Um, <coughs> that's erosion. <coughs> but, you know, okay. Let me frame it this way. If things have eroded since late 1980s, let's just say 1980s, it has also coincided the decline of a single party dominance. Yes. Okay. The 1989 was the last time we had a single party majority government. We haven't had. Now, either you can look upon the last 25 years as a growth of democratic uh, forces and or the deterioration of the quality of the polity. Mm. How do you see this? Well, it's, I mean, it's probably fairly clear by now that I'm something of an optimist about the integration of, of regional political parties into national mm. political life. And I think we're at a moment <coughs> right now where the search for a, for a strong national leader or a strong national party that comes close to a majority again rather escapes, I think, the kind of necessary work of coalition building, of negotiating diverse regional interests, and, and, and there are so many of them, um, in order to create a government which can um, pursue a, a sense of common purpose. Um, and I think maybe in, in, in the last um, term of, of, of the current um, Congress government, we've somehow somehow moved away from that kind of art of coalition building because we've had a, a party with almost a national majority again. Um, and I do wonder whether a good bout of possibly less stable coalition <laughs> government might not be a bad thing. Yeah. Um, Can I come on? Yeah, sure. Yeah. I mean, the, 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 I'm sorry to be negative again, but the, the, and, and I'm not disagreeing. The, the, the record of regional parties in the centre is pretty dismal. Um, 
I mean, regional parties want jobs in ministries that will be lucrative for them. Absolutely. And one had the ludicrous position some years ago where the Shiv Sena boss, um, Thackeray, had a minister sacked as minister of power because he wasn't paying, well, he wasn't collecting money <laughs> and paying it into the party go, coffers. Yeah. Um, yeah. The record of regional parties contributing positively to the centre is, is, is rare, if not negligible. Um, and it would be great if it happened. Maybe Nitish Kumar, if he came, um, would be different. I'm not saying it's not possible, but the record so far, and particularly in this current government, um, is, is, is appalling. Yeah, you know, I think the question then is, is it structures, institutions, fragility of coalitions, which is the problem, or is it the quality of the leader who is weak rather than strong? I mean, right now the whole country seems to, on one hand, one part of the country wants a strong leader, what I call a Dabang leader, you know, sort of Salman Khan, get up there and kick people, that sort of leader, and that's Narendra Modi. I don't mind saying Narendra Modi because I'm not a, I'm not a citizen. Uh, so, uh, uh, my visa may be withdrawn, but that's another story. And on the other, this idea is, you know, anyone but Modi. So let's have a nice coalition of third and fourth and fifth parties and get a coalition which is cuddly, but without a strong leader. Now, you know, the country, I think, is taking bets on this. You, do you see it that way? Um, well, several things I want to say about that. I mean, the first thing is that actually, I think this election that's coming down the road now in a few months, has actually become much, much more open yeah. than anyone would have thought two months ago. Uh, that's, of course, because of the emergence as a sort of disturbing factor in the political system of the Ahmadmi Party. It's, it's already had, uh, not, it's, it may be, and I think you know, at the ideological level, it's still very difficult to know exactly what it's about, both whether it's in terms of econo its economic policy or its international policy and so forth. But what it has done in the system is, is several things. I mean, one, it's already exercised pressure on both the two national parties towards paying more attention to the issues of corruption right. and transparency and so forth. And the second thing that it's done, uh, which is, uh, you know, I think a, a big shock to the system, is it's starting to make politics look attractive again to ordinary right. professional people. Uh, and I think that's a huge thing. If, if ordinary professional people can come into public life, can for the first time feel that there's some space for them to play a role in decision making, in the implementation and, and formulation of policy. That's a huge shift in Indian politics. And the, the, one of the characteristics of the last 20, 30 years has been a drift away of the best people from politics. So if it can start to do that, I think, I think that, that, that's, those are already great achievements. Um, and it'll be you know, very important to see how that plays through. The couple of other things I would just say, you know, we've been focusing on the, the, the central government, the coalition, etc. But there are other things which are also at work. I mean, I think one thing, that has happened is a great change in the political economy of this country. So, you know, where does the wealth lie today very often for most people? It lies in access to natural resources. How do you get access to natural resources? So what we've seen in the last decade is real non-transparency in the allocation sure. of, of access to natural resources. That, whether it's, it's, it's land, whether it's mining rights, whether it's uh, uh, te te telecom rights, all of these things which are there, that in turn has kind of, the, the wealth generated by that is, is developed a very close link with politicians in how those are granted. Mm. And then the third link, and I think this is, this what is the combination that makes it very threatening to, to our democracy today, is the link to the media. So there's this nexus, I think, that has emerged between those who have access to natural resource rights, the politicians, and control of the media. And each of these is really threatening to, to the future of democracy in this country. The th second thing I would just add, sure. and this again is at the, at the level of us, as, uh, of, of, of the professional civil society in India, has been a kind of decline in the, the self-invigilation of the professions. By that, I mean the standards by which lawyers hold themselves up to, the standards by yeah, which uh, uh, doctors, yeah. engineers, etc. You can now buy a license to become an airplane pilot. 
the next time you get on a flight, one doesn't know whether the person who's going to be piloting is qualified or not. So that, that kind of the, the, the breakdown of the self-invigilation of professional standards, which is not something you can directly blame the government for. That's something that, you know, in a sense, the, the, the professional citizenry have allowed to happen. I think that's, that's another issue I just wanted to, 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 to bring out here. Okay. Let me, let me put it this way. The nexus that you said of politicians and resources and media, you know, like like a summary of the radio tapes, you know, <laughs> the radio tapes are all about that nexus. Now, is it that because of liberalization, the amount of money at stake is multiplied so largely that what the minister can give or not give, you know, is just, just you know, in billions. And if I'm, if I'm a telecom license seeker, and if some, you know, minister of state is standing in my way, what is it for me if just give him 200 crores and get on with it? They must seem to have an intuition. So is it that we now face such a huge avalanche of money that things like what the Ahmadmi party wants to do may be difficult? Yes, you can stop petty corruption. You can stop the policeman, you know, harassing the, uh, the shopkeeper for hapta. That would be a good thing to do. But you won't be able to have the coalition ministry, like you were saying, you know, a minister from a, one of the coalition parties going to what they call the ATM ministry. And, and just, and is, is, is it just too, it's too much money? Then? Yes, I, a, I think you it's... You're an economist, so you know all no, I'm not an economist, you're an economist. <laughs> no, you um, write for the economist. So oh, I used to write for the economist. <laughs> um, it's, it's a huge amount of money. I mean, the temptation <coughs> to bureaucrats and to politicians even the most, and I've had conversations with people about this, and I'm reflecting on conversations that I've had in the last few weeks and months. The, the, the temptation to an honest bureaucrat who right through his career has tried to do the right thing, who's done, made all the right decisions, suddenly he becomes the additional secretary or the secretary or the special secretary, and he's given <laughs> charge of allocating something or other. Maybe special economic zones, maybe telecom licenses, maybe yeah. something. And somebody comes along and says, there's a million dollars for you. Or maybe he says, there's five million dollars. But $1 million would be enough. <coughs> the temptation to take that and persuade yourself that that's it, I'm not going to do it anymore, I'll, I'll just take that one, must be enormous. Because it's, it's, it's life-changing. It's life-changing for your family. Exactly. The way you can yeah. handle, invest that money. I mean, you're changing the life for your children, especially if you're offered several million, and you probably will be offered several million. You're suddenly in one little decision which will take you 10 seconds or two minutes changing the prospects for you and your family for generations. Yeah. The temptation to do that, and it's natural resources that have done that. Earlier it was, it was manufacturing licenses and, and, and other things there. But it's this huge investment in infrastructure, when we go back to Andhra Pradesh, because that was collusion between the chief minister and the infrastructure builders, <laughs> mainly. Um, it's, it's mining all over the country. There's massive money at stake. Uh, and the temptation, and I say this, I mean, if it doesn't sound too pompous, sympathetically, the temptation to change the life for your family for generations must be enormous. I'm told what you do is you say, no, no, I don't want money, but I have a son and a daughter who want to go abroad for education. No, I think that's old. I think that's, I th no, I th okay, I think that's, that's early. Idea. That's been happening for ages. I'm, as has I'm as has, update myself. as has buying jobs. I'm I mean, update myself. No, no, that was. Um, <laughs> I mean, that still happens, okay, but that's, that's been happening that's for small decades. Change. That is small change. <laughs> that's small change. So, so, I mean, we used to think once upon a time that the center people who are honest stayed very corrupt. Now I think it's, it's kind of universalization of corruption, isn't it? What, what is your experience? <laughs> <laughs> They're all corrupt. Hamam is so People talk about the, the centralization exactly. and decentralization exactly. of corruption. <laughs> yes. I mean, that's a good <laughs> subject. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, Yes, I mean, I suppose one of the interesting things looking at governance in the states these days is... Um, okay, yeah. yeah. Mm. Let me say, despite all that, mm. people still put their faith in legislation. They think if we get a Lokpal, if we get a Lokayukt, mm. if we get a new law, somehow, law is going to solve everything. And you know, I have my, my own doubts about this because as John was saying, if the legal system has eroded, how are you going to enforce things? Does that need a different kind of uh, politics, different kind of constitution? What, what, what is it that, I'll give you first goal and then uh, 
yeah. Well, what, what do you think should be done to tackle corruption, which is on everybody's mind as a big problem? Well, that's a, that's a, that's a million dollar question. You and have I, three I think, minutes. I, I, yeah. <laughs> I think when we talk about corruption, we have to remember that it means such different things to different people yeah. um, and occurs at such different scales. Um, I mean, one, one of the interesting stories that I've been following recently is how some states have managed to reform the delivery of certain public services in ways that have reduced the ability for local politicians yeah. Yeah. to treat government schemes as patronage yeah. systems, as, as doles. Yeah and instead to move towards a system in which there is a certain degree of regularity about the kinds of mm. basic services, I'm talking about things like the delivery of subsidised sure. food yeah, through yeah, the public yeah. distribution mm. system, that citizens can, can routinely expect. Um, and that in itself involves tackling a kind of corruption, um, but it's not, dis it's not talked about in those mm. terms in political discourse. It's talked about as a, you know, a form of service delivery or often pejoratively as a kind mm. of delivering subsidies. Um, but you know, there are those forms of public service delivery reform and administrative reform mm. which are taking place in the States. Um, mm. uh, not, not universally yeah. and in pockets, but, but this kind of, of institutional <laughs> rethinking and redesign is kind of, you know, Taking, taking fruit and some of those it, 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 may, may, yeah, it may be that we are doing something about petty corruption by online, using online. And in the meantime, the real attention is to uh, big corruption. But citizens are interested in getting rid of petty corruption. You know, what, what is it to me if, you know, Kani Moli gets 300 crores? I want my hafta not to be have to be given to the policeman every week. That's what I want. Do you, you think you think that one yeah. should one should make that kind of distinction? Well, I think it, as Louis said, and as I think you, you've also suggested, I mean there are many different types of corruption. In the sense that the, the the kind that affects most people on a daily basis is what is I think incorrectly referred to as petty corruption because it's not petty it's actually extremely <coughs> important and, 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 and very really felt corruption and where and that is you know where someone is trying to get a place for their child in a school or get into a hospital or get a, a police officer to register a case or whatever it might be get a water connection and so forth and there um, it seems to me you know w w there are a number of things that that, that, that can be brought to bear on that. I mean, one is this very powerful legislation which we now have called the Right to Information Act. Yes. And I think that is something that, is that there's still much, much more scope to be used uh, by, by the media, by citizenry, by a variety of different groups, because that is a powerful a tool that's in the hand of citizens to hold uh, uh, public authorities to account. And that's one area. The other is, 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 is through the, the media itself to keep this as a kind of constant campaigning issue, not just to pick up on the big corruption stories, run with them for three weeks and then move on, but to actually keep these, these uh, kind of steady focus on this as a kind of really urgent issue. And you know, the third is, I guess, uh, governments being more um, willing to, well, uh, you know, it was interesting when, when uh, Arvind Kejriwal said in Delhi, you know, basically f film, uh, you know, go out and film people uh, yeah. Yeah. when yeah. they're asking for money or being corrupt. I mean, you saw an immediate spike in the sales of uh, the <laughs> smartphones with, vi with video cameras and, and, you know, video. And that's a great thing. I think, you know, that kind sure. of, um, th there's also uh, hazards to that kind of civic vigilantism, if you like. But it's, it, that's an important tool to actually record and disseminate these these acts of corruption on an everyday level, and and you know then and the, th the the other thing I would add is then to actually use the law to sanction acts of corruption. Mm. Too often yeah. today, ca course ca cases just go on forever, and there's no actual punishment yeah. for yeah. the people who have yeah. uh, who have been a a a accused of corruption. The, the cases are never settled, the punishments are never carried out. So I think if there are if there's some you know high visibility to the sanction of it. That's really important. The last thing I would just say as a general point, which is, you know, the democracy and corruption have always been sort of twin terms. I mean, the, the fact that democracy is a corrupt goes, or seen as being corrupt, goes right back to the discussion of classical democracy 
in, in Athens. So there's always, people have always been skeptical of democracy as a form because it's susceptible to corruption. So it's not, it's, there's nothing unusual. Or you can, again, if you look at 19th century America or 19th century Britain or you know, any of the great democracies, uh, the, the, the discussion about corruption is continuous with their growth as democracies and with the creation of inventions to deal with that corruption. So I, I think that's just a, a general point I would make. Yeah, and don't forget, of course, that corruption is as bad in China as it is in, as it okay. is in India. Absolutely. So it's, it's, not a, it's not a facet of democracy. Only there they shoot them when they, find, when they decide that they've got to clamp down on somebody, whereas in India you wonder what to do. Um, look, I, if I, what I'm about to Make say... Make him chief I, minister. Even, yeah, exactly. Um, for God's sake, don't tackle petty corruption first. And if I'm quoted on that, I shall say I was quoted out of context. Because the context, the context in which I'm saying it is that petty corruption is fantastic because it makes people angry. People would not have been on the streets um, no, no. two or three years ago uh, <coughs> when I was water cannoned off, off Rajpath one night. Um, sorry, that was the rape demonstrations, ELA yeah, um, uh, They would not have been out protesting about corruption with Hazari um, if it hadn't been for petty corruption. Because right. it was the petty corruption that got them out when they also saw the corruption going right the way up to the top which was with, with the government, which was more blatantly and openly corrupt and doing less about it than any other government probably in history. Of course you've got to deal with it. Yeah. Um, on the schemes, um, the problem is that governments are more interested in creating new schemes, normally with Gandhi or Nehru or some name attached, um, than they are in making sure that, that, that they are delivered properly. Um, I've heard Monte Singh Alwalia, the, um, de who runs the planning commission, say at a, at, at a conference um, that he knows that X percentage, I forget what percentage he used, so I'm not going to put a figure on this in this sentence, that X percentage, something huge, way over half, gets lost on the way down, but he's got to do some more. He said, I'm sorry, I've just got to do these schemes. Yeah. Maybe you need a planning commission chief who says to the, to the head of the government, I won't do any more schemes until we improve the delivery. But in order to tackle corruption, and since I'm supposed to be an economist, at least for a few minutes, um, let, let, let me talk as an economist and say you've got to tackle the demand side. Yeah. The demand side is the politicians who want the money. Mm. And if you reform the political funding of yeah, parties, I know this is yeah. an old chestnut which has been discussed for years, but you've got to attack <coughs> The people. You've got to tackle it at the, at the source of the demand. And the source of the demand is politicians who need money. Yeah. I've talked to, um, I've got a friend who's an MLA um, in, in, in one of the southern states, and I've known him since he started in politics. And it cost him a few crore to get started. He had to get that money from somewhere. Sure. And then a few people, he got it quite honestly, people don't make donations. But after that, he, he knew that those people would expect him to do them a few favours. And that's the innocent way of starting. It's rather like my bureaucrat who, who, make, who makes one decision in order to make his family rich. This guy, in order to get started, had to borrow some money. He then had to do some favours. He's not an MLA now, so I can't, there's no awful end to that story. Um, but unless you change the funding of politicians and funding of elections, you will never stop corruption. So start there, and then the politicians will have less excuse um, for demanding money, and then people will get more angry, and slowly you'll get change, as well as the important things like RTI um, and, and, and automatic um, ele electronic delivery of money and all the other vetting schemes that you can do with new technology. Yeah. Let me just want to say one thing about that, that one thing Ahmadmi Party has done is much more transparency of where it gets the money from. Yeah. And it may be that other parties may be, may be pressurized to set up at least some form of uh, transparency. But also, the political parties, to a man and woman, refuse to have political parties come under the RTI. They know what is at stake. If RTI is excluded the political parties, we will see some real, real scandals. Anyway, mm. what is your take on that? Uh, well, I mean, to take a slightly unpopular position, I yes, suppose. Maybe, maybe, um, let me see this. So let's start summing up, mm. because then we'll have give the people more time to work. So what is your final take on implosion, <laughs> remapping, <laughs> corruption, <laughs> Amadmi Party, Narendra Modi, etc.? <laughs> I, mean, I suppose as someone who's written about remapping India, it may not come as a surprise to think that I, I, I 
shy away from all India generalizations. I recognize the picture that John is giving us. I recognize that politicians need money, they will find money, um, that government schemes have proliferated beyond our imagination, but there are also in which you have reformers in different states across the country who are seriously trying to tackle questions of public service delivery in ways that have had results. Um, and I think to, to assume that, um, th that, that we need a kind of big shot way of, of tackling high level corruption and, and rooting out th those kind of diseases um, is, is what we should be aiming for, misses the fact that there are already ongoing processes of administrative reform which are, are starting to tackle some of these things. So I suppose I'm slightly more of an okay. optimist um, but I hope still a realist <laughs> and, and, not, and not viewing things. Yeah, I'm, um, I'm, not, I'm not suggesting that you shouldn't do, have all those mm. things, but I'm saying if you want a, a big central thing to do, mm. then reform the political funding. Mm. I mean, I don't know whether it's possible for, for individual states to do it, but to start in that way. Mm. But this is a, you're looking for some sort of big, big, broad you're, view. You're, you're, well, you're my big, broad you're. view <coughs> would, would be, and I'm sure I shall get be laughed at for this, but if only um, Kedriwal and, and, and Raul Gandhi had somehow got together um, a year or two ago, and if Raul Gandhi had only woken up a year or two ago, because he's now actually saying the, half the right things, if only those two had got together and started to change politics, then I think we would be looking at a, at a new India. We need changes at the center. We need the old political ways changed and, and doing broad sweep stuff, broad sweep generalizations. Um, and Kedriwal who's got no experience, and Raoul, who's never bothered to show any, <laughs> do have, do, do what have. What a great combination. It's, a, such a, it's, it's, it's such a cheap shot. You get a laugh for poor Raoul Gandhi. I mean, um, three cheers for him. Um, it, 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 it's new people coming into politics, and it's youth demanding change. In the next election, those votes may go into chaos because of Kedriwal att attracting votes and not being able to deliver. Let's see where it goes. But we need new leaders and, and, and new youth coming in to change things. You know, Kedriwal and Rahul Gandhi may yet talk to each other, but after the election. Uh, when, when you well, somebody was trying to persuade you somebody was somebody was trying to persuade me here earlier today that in fact they've been talking to each other for about a year <laughs> and the whole thing is planned. I don't believe that. <laughs> this is your chance to just sort it all out. <laughs> <laughs> well, the give, nation give, is waiting. Uh, I think we'll need a few more literary <laughs> festival uh, get, get together. But let, let, let me make a, a, point, a point that sta stands back a bit from the immediate rush of uh, election <coughs> season and so on, and, and, and because I'm sure there'll be more of that in the discussion. But and, and here's where I think there is reason to 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 at least feel in principle optimistic, uh, and that's this: that you know, all democracies are when they're working well, are essentially learning mechanisms. They, they're, they're ways of trying to learn from how you, from your mistakes. How do you get better? And in fact, I mean, the US is an extraordinary example of that, where it, it from a whole series, from political uh, crises, from international crises, from economic crises, it's each time it's learned and created a capacity to be more robust in the face of future crises. And in a sense, the, the Indian uh, post-1947 story uh, has, is, is partially that as well, and that's something that needs to, 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 to happen more. And what I would say here is that, you know, with the 28 states already in the Union and more that are likely to be created in the next few years, we have an extraordinary internal laboratory of different experiences. As Louise said, you know, there, there are some that are doing really well, there are some that are not doing really well. And it's not for the obvious reasons why some are doing well and others are not doing well. Like we think great leadership is necessary for a state to do well. Well, that's not always the case. In fact, leaders can come and go and a state can still do well because the bureaucracy works, because the administration works, because hospitals, <coughs> schools, and so on work. And a perfect example of that would be Tamil Nadu. You've had yeah. uh, chief ministers coming and going, political parties mm -hmm. coming and going, and yet the, the bureaucracy, the administration has continued to deliver health, education, all of those basic services. So this idea that it's only a good leader that can do it is, I think, a delusion. So the point there is if we study, if we learn from the kinds of different experiences of the Indian states, if we can actually evaluate a bit more what the effects of social policy are, what, what we do at the moment is we just scatter a whole range of different policies and then we never actually look at what their effects are. 
We, they, they sort of carry on for years and years and years. They become entrenched. Even reservations itself. You know, as you as you know, in the Constitution, they were supposed to be only for ten years and then renewed yeah. thereafter. But no one has. We don't actually have objective studies of what their effects right have been. It, yeah. It's all based on here uh, on anecdotal evidence, essentially. And that's where I think something like the Hindu Center for Politics and Public Policy, or you know, to feed these into public debate, to feed them into the political parties, into the thinking of the political parties, so they can actually use them to define their, their manifestos, their agendas, present the citizenry with real choices about how to act in relation to these problems, rather than simple generalities about what they're going right. to do. You know, so, so that's what I would just end, end yeah. my bit on. Yeah. One, of the, one of the subplots, or the main plots in, in, in my book, <coughs> is, is, is oh. Jugard and Jugar or Jugard and Chaltahe. Um, I, 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 I wasn't going to mention this, but I'm picking up your, what you've just said. Um, it strikes me that um, a lot of what happens here in, in this country is a fix-it solution yeah. rather than serious policy debate. Mm -hmm. And if you have a society which believes in Jagar, which believes in fix-it, and then Charter Hay, which is everything's going to be all right on the night, you don't get a, a government or a bureaucracy or institutions, a, apart from um, academic, um, who seriously go into, into these subjects and look at them for Absolutely. solutions. Okay, now it's your turn to ask questions. I don't want any solutions from any of you. I want questions. <laughs> Quick, short questions. Now, the gentleman sitting in the middle there, on, on your, on your the, over there, behind you, behind you, that one. Ask a nice, short question. Yes, I'll... I'll uh, uh, my I'll, question is to John. Uh, do you see a silver lining? <laughs> Has ah. to be golden. <laughs> Yes, of, of course I do, because it's a country with, with enormous potential, <coughs> with great natural resources, with great people, with great culture, with great history, uh, and with a, a, a lot of young people who want it to be different more passionately than earlier generations did. And I've been here on and off for 30 years. Um, certainly the passion for change among the, the young is much stronger now because there's a belief that they can change things. Um, I think before people were just going to accept things as they were, I think the desire for change is the, is, is the silver lining. And, and a country with such huge um, capacity in all the ways I've just mentioned must eventually solve this. Okay, there's a lady, a young lady there, just right, right there. Yeah. I'll, I'll come to you, Bina, in a minute. Uh. Can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, okay, this is not going to be a short question. No, but no, make it short. Okay, I'll try my best. <laughs> make it short. I'll try my best. Um, one of the things that India really is at the crossroads with is freedom of speech and expression. Um, I can feel it as a citizen and... No. Is that the case or not? Why don't you just ask that? <laughs> All right. Well, the question is that I can feel a certain kind of fear that is injected into the polity over the last several months. It's the kind of fear that makes editors of mainstream newspapers and magazines self-censor themselves. Uh, it's the kind of fear that sidesteps a certain kind of discussion at okay. even the Jaipur Literature Festival. And maybe it's also the kind of fear that makes someone as eminent as uh, Meghna Desai joke uh, when he has to take a certain name about a political candidate. And my question is that I really want the panelists to address this aspect of a certain dilution of freedom of speech and expression head on. Um, okay. Thank you. I think Thank you. Really Thank you. No, no, that, 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 that's it. You know, I just used to say a lot make that they say jokes all the time. Uh, he's not worried about any freedom of expression. Uh, now, tell me, <laughs> are you afraid of Narendra Modi? <laughs> I have. I haven't uttered his name myself, but I, but I will, and I'm not afraid to. Um, I don't know. I mean, I think maybe what you're, what you're getting at there is a, is a sense of partiality on the part of many media organizations, um, that it's as, uh, it's, as, it's as much a question about objectivity in reporting as it is fear of taking certain positions. Um, I, there's a lot of vigorous debate in, uh, um, in the Indian media, but, but maybe not always in the directions that, 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 that we might wish. 
Okay. Mm. I mean, it's, it's not, it's, it's, um, if you think there's no freedom of expression, just watch the appalling chat shows on television every evening. Um, <laughs> on, on freedom of I'm expression. I'm on most of them. I know you are. Um, <laughs> and then people tell you that you should not deal with Indian politics because you're a politician in London where you should stay. Absolutely. Um, uh, I don't worry about freedom of expression. What I do worry about, I mean, in this context, what I do worry about is corporate ownership of newspapers exactly. and corporate newspaper ownership of newspapers who, who, are, um, who want Narendra Modi elected and who therefore control what appears um, in the newspapers and on television. And I didn't mention Mukesh Ambani. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I think that's a really, really important, I totally agree with that. That's a really important one. The only thing I would just add to that is I think, you know, we're, we're, there's also been in, in the many different democratizations that have occurred over the last uh, 65 plus years, 67 years in India, there's also now been a democratization of offense. So everyone now <laughs> has the right to be offended. Uh, and, and not only that, but to actually kind of, you know, make public uh, disturbance about that. Yeah. And that has become a kind of way also of checking the space, constraining the space of free expression uh, and, 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 and free speech. And that, in a sense, is going to be a necessary battle that we have to play out. Because at a time of great social change, when certain kind of mar certain ways of doing things, <coughs> certain habitual customs and so on are, are, are going to be questioned and challenged. There's, de there's going to be a kind of contestation between those trying to expand the space of free speech and those who want to keep it under constraint. So I don't see that as somehow uh, 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 an unusual thing. It's part of the process of expanding the realm of freedom in our society. Can I say something else? So one yeah, last hang on, question. Hang on, hang on, hang on. No, no, we, we have, no then we I don't. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we uh, have time for one question now. It's not 6 o'clock yet, time no, to we, 6. Vinagarwal. Uh, <laughs> it's, 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 it's not 5 2 yet. It, it, it's not even 5 2. Vinagarwal. She may just give yeah. an answer, okay. not ask um, a question. Since Meghnath, you're going to give me like three seconds. Um, I just want to say that, look, we are also, in there as a, as a moral, there's a moral crossroads at which we are. If you look at the professionals of the 70s, RTI came out of huge sacrifices. Aruna Roy, Bankura, I mean, all these people went out. And somehow we've lost that. So I want to bring back the question, what is our idea of a good life? And what are we going to use our natural resources for? Shouldn't we be asking that again? Um, people want change. Are they willing to sacrifice for that? OK. Yes or I no? knew you were going to turn to me yes first. No? <laughs> OK. OK. Well, 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 one, of the, one of the big debates, of course, which, which has to take place, and it's not taking place as it should, is, 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 the, is the Jaira and Ramesh, um, et cetera, Please. argument about, about new, new projects and the environment. Yeah. And there's a desperate need in this country. There's been a lot of debate about growth versus freebies, the, 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 the um, current government's allocation of freebies rather than worrying about growth. Equally serious, or it may be more serious, is the debate about growth and the environment and how do you balance the need for infrastructure projects and all the rest with, with, the, with the need for economic growth. You've got to get into the forest, you've got to do some mining, but you've got to do it in the right way and it's a debate which has not taken, taken place so far. I'm terribly tempted to come back to a point which I ought to have made just now and this is probably very tactful. I don't mind newspaper owners providing we know who they are. With the Hindu who was just going, we're on the Hindu platform. With the Hindu who has controversially changed their editor, we knew, we know who the Hindu owners are. We don't know, with a lot of the other newspapers, who the owners are. They're not visible. Okay. Now, uh, I, I'm, I'm told I have no more time, but since I don't know the orders. Uh, shall, we, shall we end the session, please? Okay. My freedom of speech has been curtailed. <laughs> what is yeah, it? But, but let me say this. As, as uh, uh, Sunil was saying uh, about democratization of uh, offense, the JLF crisis is yet to come. There are two more days before we get an FIR. <laughs> <laughs> with, that, with that good thought in your mind. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. For